Imagine a machine that combines the speed of a supersonic hustler with the devastating punch of the heavyweight buff. A marvel of military engineering that skirts the edge of legend and reality. An airplane that's like the F-14 Tomcat's big brother they never warned you about. Welcome to the world of the B-1 Lancer, affectionately known as the Bone. This isn't just the story of any bomber. It's a tale of resilience, a blend of power and speed that has defied the odds. Outperforming the legendary B-52 in bomb load, the bone struck fear into the hearts of its adversaries, so much so that it was deliberately restrained by international treaties. But there's a twist. It was canceled not once, but twice. And yet, it soared back, stronger than ever, while obtaining over 60 world records. Today, we're diving into the secrets of this iconic aircraft, the last of the American swing wings. From its unexpected origins to its crucial role in modern conflicts, the B-1 Lancer's story is more than just metal and machinery. So fasten your seatbelts, hit that subscribe button, and join me on a high-octane journey to uncover why the bone is an indispensable titan of the skies, is stealthier than you think, and is needed now more than ever. PilotPhotog.com Today, America uses three types of bombers, each with a different primary mission. The stealthy B-2 Spirit, the venerable B-52 Stratofortress, and of course, the fast B-1 Lancer. When you need to strike a target with total surprise, you send in the B-2. When you want an overhead presence that can strike at any time, you send in the B-52. So when does the B-1 come into play? Well, when you need a rapid, low-level delivery, flying under the radar, you send in the bone. To really understand where the B-1 fits in today, you have to go back to its origins. By the late 1950s, new anti-aircraft missiles made flying at high altitudes a risk for bombers. This was proven beyond a doubt when Gary Powers' U-2 plane was infamously shot down in 1960. As a result, the U.S. Air Force started flying its bombers lower to hide from radar using hills and valleys in a tactic known as terrain masking. Low-flying bombers are harder to detect because the radar would get confused with ground objects and couldn't see below a certain angle. This made anti-aircraft missiles less effective against low-flying aircraft. Case in point, the B-58 Hustler was designed for high-speed flying, yet it wasn't good at low levels. After just under 10 years in service, the B-58 program was canceled. Meanwhile, the B-52 bomber, though originally not made for low flying, could perform the task, but it was not really suited for it. Because of this, new designs called penetrators were developed for long, low-level flights. The F-111 fighter bomber was the first true penetrator aircraft, and as a result, the Air Force wanted a bomber that could combine the Mach 2 speeds of the B-58 Hustler with the range and payload of the B-52. This new bomber would eventually replace both the B-58 and B-52, or so the Air Force thought. These requirements led to the Advanced Manned Strategic Aircraft, or AMSA, project, which was about making a new bomber that could perform similarly to the F-111. As the AMSA project timeline wore on and on, the joke was that AMSA actually stood for America's Most Studied Aircraft, However, some people questioned if a new bomber was even needed, since long-range ICBMs and submarine-launched missiles were seen as better for defense. Defense Secretary at the time, Robert McNamara, preferred ICBMs and limited the bomber program to just studies and developing parts. These bomber studies went on, focusing on advanced technology. But McNamara didn't want a new bomber, preferring to improve the B-52s and use FP-111s for shorter missions. The AMSA project looked like it was in jeopardy. As you know, in the world of military aviation, projects like the iconic B-1 bomber often navigate through a maze of political debates and decisions. It's a realm where understanding different perspectives is crucial, just like in the B-1's journey from blueprint to sky. And when it comes to staying well-informed, especially in our complex and multifaceted world, 
Having a reliable source like today's sponsor, Ground News, is as vital as having the right intel in an aircraft development project. Ground News offers that broad spectrum of viewpoints, ensuring you're as well equipped in your knowledge as a pilot in the cockpit of a B-1 bomber. This platform combines articles from some 50,000 local and international sources in one place, making it easy to access and allowing you to compare coverage. For example, recently, the Philippine military announced joint patrols with the U.S. in the South China Sea, and it was barely covered by the media. This comes as somewhat of a surprise because tensions are rising in the area almost daily. We can see 17 articles have been published about this in the last day, with most of the sources coming from a center-leaning view. I appreciate that I can also see who owns these sources and how factual their reporting practices tend to be. What I really find useful is that I can skim the headlines and see how the story is being reported. In this case, we can see that sources on the right include the strengthening of the alliance between the U.S. and Philippines, while sources on the left highlight the actions of Chinese warships. And you can see these at a glance on the Ground News site, which is available on desktop or mobile. So if you care about the truth like I do and are tired of the misleading media narratives, then you really need to be using Ground News. I highly recommend you check out the site. Go to ground.news slash pilot photo. The link is in the description. Right now, you can get 30% off unlimited access to the Vantage plan by using my link. Subscribing not only supports my channel, but this small team working to hold the media accountable. I find their platform really useful, and I think you will too. Thank you, Ground News, and getting back to the B-1. While the AMSA project was essentially canceled in the late 1960s, Richard Nixon bought it back after he became president. By April of 1969, the program officially became known as the B-1A. Proposals by General Dynamics, Boeing, and Rockwell were submitted in January of 1970, with Rockwell winning the contract in June of that year. The initial design of the B-1A was incredible. The airplane featured an escape capsule in case the pilots had to eject at high speeds. With swing wings that could sweep out for takeoffs and landings, then sweep back for high-speed flight. Interestingly, with its wings fully swept out, the B-1 could land in airfields that the B-52 couldn't. When it came to speed, the B-1A was fast, reaching Mach 2 plus at high altitudes and even Mach 1.2 at low altitude. However, the problem for the bone was cost. In 1970, a single B-1 was $40 million. But with the runaway inflation of that era, that cost jumped up to 70 million in 1975. As a result, Rockwell began finding ways to lower the cost of the bomber, so ejection seats were used instead of the escape capsule, and the low-level speed requirement was decreased to Mach 0.85, which allowed for less use of titanium in the wings and fuselage, keeping costs down. More on that in a minute. Despite these efforts by Rockwell to scale back costs, by the time Jimmy Carter took office in 1977, the estimated costs of each bomber had risen to $100 million, and there were several competing projects. First, President Carter was made aware of a top-secret stealth bomber which was under development, known as the Advanced Technology Bomber, or ATB. This would eventually become the B-2 Spirit. Secondly, Pentagon officials stated that the new AGM-68 air-launched cruise missile, or ALCM, could be launched at safe distances from a B-52 and penetrate Soviet air defenses. Based on this, President Carter announced in June of 1977 that the B-1 was canceled, in favor of submarine land-based nuclear missiles and a modernization program for the B-52. In an interesting twist of fate, the ATB program that produced the B-2, which was a deciding factor in the cancellation of the B-1, actually helped bring the B-1 back to life, as we'll soon see. Publicly, Carter's cancellation of the project was split among partisan lines. Republicans were for keeping the B-1 program, while Democrats were against it. During his 1980 presidential campaign, Ronald Reagan strongly argued that Carter was not doing enough for defense often pointing to the cancellation of the B-1 program as a prime example. Upon being elected to office, Reagan had to decide if the ATB stealth bomber would be ready in time or if the B-1 program should be resurrected as a stopgap. With the ATB bomber taking longer than expected, 
the decision was made. In January of 1982, the Air Force gave Rockwell two contracts totaling $2.2 billion to develop and build 100 B-1 bombers. The design was updated for the missions they now expected, creating the B-1B. These updates included slowing down the maximum speed to improve stealth. This allowed for the use of simpler, fixed geometry intake ramps instead of the variable ones. Along with changes to the air intakes, the Lancer also makes use of serpentine or S-shaped ducts to hide the engine fan blades from enemy radar emissions. And although not technically a stealth aircraft, the B-1 has a radar cross-section that is about 1 50th of a B-52. These and other changes made the B-1B slightly less visible on radar, a worthwhile trade-off for the slower speed as air defenses were becoming more sophisticated. The new focus was all about higher subsonic speeds at low altitudes, which produced an increase from about Mach 0.85 to 0.92 on the deck. The B-1B's top speed is around Mach 1.2 at higher altitudes. Although at the time there were still critics of the B-1B, the main arguments in its favor were the ability to carry nuclear and conventional bombs and the takeoff performance that allowed it to operate from a much wider variety of airfields as compared to the B-52. The first production B-1B rolled off the assembly line in 1984, and the 100th Lancer was delivered in 1988. In looking at the B-1, you may have noticed some small canard-like wings or veins near the nose of the bomber. These are part of an anti-dampening system known as Structural Mode Control System or SMCS. This combined system helps smooth out what would otherwise be a very bumpy low altitude ride while protecting the structure of the aircraft. When it comes to the engines, the Lancer packs a punch. The bone is powered by four afterburning GEF 101 engines, each putting out more than 30,000 pounds of thrust with afterburner. That's 120,000 pounds of freedom. Imagine the sound of this thing on takeoff. The powerful F-101 engine would go on to be developed into the GE F-110 engine, which was used on the Super Tomcat and the F-16 Fighting Falcon, aka the Viper. It's hard to understate how fast the B-1 is for a bomber. As we mentioned earlier, the Lancer holds over 60 world records in the form of speed, payload, distance, and time to climb. One of the more memorable records was set in 1993 when three B-1Bs set a long distance record, showcasing its ability to perform strikes anywhere in the world without any stop. However, what's a bomber without bombs? We've hinted earlier at the Bone's massive bomb load, which is greater than the B-52. It turns out that the B-1 can carry 75,000 pounds of bombs inside not one, not two, but three internal bomb bays. On top of this, the Lancer has six external hardpoints, which can carry a total of 50,000 pounds of ordnance. It's a lot of firepower hanging on the outside. These external hardpoints give the B-1 flexibility in carrying oversized weapons that may not fit inside the internal bomb bays. And the amount of weapon options the Lancer can take are staggering. Everything from long-range anti-ship missiles to conventional free-fall bombs, cluster bombs, and of course, precision-guided bombs. The B-1 also uses rotary-mounted launchers to dispense JDAMs, giving new meaning to the phrase, reach out and touch someone. Speaking of precision-guided weapons, the Lancer can make use of Lockheed's Sniper XR pod, which allows the B-1 to use multiple sensor formats to positively self-identify targets before prosecuting them. Conventional weapons, initially an add-on for the B-1 program, may have been what actually has kept the bomber in service. The idea of a supersonic-capable, low-flying strategic bomber gave the Russians nightmares during the Cold War. In fact, the B-1 was so feared that it was specifically called out in a nuclear arms treaty and had to be reconfigured as to not allow it to carry nuclear weapons. These modifications included adjustments to the hard points to prevent nuclear weapon pylons from being attached, the removal of weapons bay wiring bundles that could arm nuclear weapons, and the destruction of nuclear weapons pylons. These conversions were completed in 2011 
and Russian officials inspect the bombers every year to verify compliance. Officially, the B-1 first saw combat not in 1991's Desert Storm, but in the 1998 Desert Fox campaign, where it dropped mostly unguided general purpose weapons. Since then, B-1s have seen action in the Kosovo Allied Force campaign, the Operation Enduring Freedom campaign in Afghanistan, and in the 2003 Second Gulf War. During these conflicts, the B-1 dropped both conventional and precision guided bombs, more than sharing the load of all ordnance dropped. For example, in the first six months of Operation Enduring Freedom, eight B-1s were responsible for dropping almost 40% of the bombs used by coalition air forces. This included about 3,900 JDAMs, making up 60% of the total dropped. During Operation Iraqi Freedom, the B-1 played a significant role despite flying less than 1% of the combat missions, as it delivered 43% of the JDAMs used. That works out to about 480 JDAMs dropped per Lancer. In 2012, the 9th Expeditionary Bomb Squadron returned from his six-month tour in Afghanistan. The squadron's 9B1s flew 770 sorties, making it the most of any B1 squadron on a single deployment. During this time, the squadron spent 9,500 hours airborne and always kept at least one of its bombers in the air at all times. In doing this, the 9th accounted for a quarter of all combat aircraft sorties over Afghanistan, while fulfilling an average of two to three air support requests per day. And while we all love the A-10 swooping in and supporting troops on the ground, sometimes we forget that the B-1 has saved the lives of many an allied soldier, possibly even some viewers of this video. B-1s also participated in operations against ISIS in Syria as part of Operation Inherent Resolve, during which, on 31 separate occasions, the bombers went Winchester, meaning they dropped all their payload. Today, the B-1 remains active, continuing to fly missions daily in ongoing operations. With its high speed and long range, the B-1 has evolved into a quasi-self-bomber that is effective in conventional warfare against ground targets. Interestingly, the B-1 is seen as a useful asset for maritime duties, such as patrolling shipping lanes, a feature that could come in very handy in the Pacific Theater of Operations. Currently, there are plans to upgrade the bone to keep the aircraft viable, with some estimates showing it being in service until 2038. And as you have now heard, the B-21 Raider is in development and already flying. However, if there are delays in the Raider program, then history could repeat itself. After all, the bone was greenlit because the B-2 Spirit was taking longer than anticipated. In a similar way, what if the B-21 takes longer and the Lancer gets an extension on its operational life? In many ways, it would be a fitting addition to the story of the twice-canceled misunderstood and feared bomber that is the bone. One last thing, the Air Force had proposed an updated version of the bone, one that would have slightly less range but more speed. It was referred to as the B1R with R standing for regional. You never know when I may release my next video unless, of course, you subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications. You can support me by supporting today's sponsor, Ground News, getting an awesome mug on my shop, or joining my awesome Patreon crew. The B-1 Lancer. Fear the bone. Now you know. PilotPhotog.com